The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we're going to continue in John chapter 17. And I just want to say that I got about halfway through recording this entire sermon before uh, before the enemy threw an attack and the enemy is defeated. He is a defeated foe and the, the Lord is our victor. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is the banner of victory going before us, declaring the battle is won. But what I want to do today is is I want to go back into Luke 17. I want to get this teaching finished. But what we're going to do is we're going to start in verse 11. Because I want to... Uh, yesterday when I was recording this, I kind of skipped over this passage. Because this first little section is not eschatological. It doesn't have end time implication. But there is a powerful understanding connecting verses 11 to 19 to what we talked about yesterday. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray... Then we're going to jump right into the lesson. So, Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your Son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion. Transforming us by the renewing of our mind. Conforming us to the image of Christ. Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So, let's do this. Let is, uh, let's go to verse 11. We're going to start by just reading through the passage, and then I want to take some time to overview everything that we've talked about, and then go through this teaching today. Most of the last half of Luke 17 is what we already read out of Matthew 24, 25. So we've already read a lot of these truths, and we got this understanding of the days of Noah down pretty well. So we can do a lot of verses in just one lesson. So let's go through it. Let's start in verse 11. And it came to pass... As he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, and he entered into a certain village. There met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall see not see it. And they shall say to you, See here or see there. Go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteth out of one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it were in the days of and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, 
he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. One shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding together. One shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wherever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now, let us take just a second. I'm only going to take just a brief second and overview what we talked about the past two days. The very first day we talked about not being offended and walking in forgiveness. That's the, that's the main point. And we spent 30 minutes on just those verses. And then yesterday, we talked about one of the most powerful parables in the whole Bible. The parable where Jesus talked about the mustard seed and the sycamine tree. But I just want to just reference this. I'm not going to go through it in detail because we could talk about this parable for a long time. Jesus said, but he said, you are not comparing this parable to me. This is you, which is in contradiction to me. He said, because you would make the servant serve and then serve and then allow them to eat. You know, you wouldn't even thank them. He goes, and you would think if you were the servant, oh, we're unprofitable. We had to do it to earn it. Jesus says, that is not the way of the kingdom. He said, the way of the kingdom is I make you to sit down and I serve you. Just go back into Luke chapter 12. You can read that. Jesus says, when you come into the wedding feast, the, the bridegroom will make you to sit down and be served. So Jesus makes a comparison. The way in which most people, and the way the mindset of many people were, is you have to work first before you can receive. And Jesus says the way of the kingdom is you receive first, then you have action that corresponds with it. That's faith. You don't pollute your faith by the way in which you deem the fact I have to work to earn it, even though God already gave it. That's what's called frustrating grace. And that's what he was explaining. And the very next passage is an example of this in which Jesus gave first. Then it brought a response. I mean, he healed a Samaritan first. Like it, He healed 10 people and the Samaritan came back and brought glory to God. The Samaritans were not under the covenant. They're not Jews. Yet a Samaritan was healed along with nine others. But the Samaritan had the right response to give glory to God and then to go and show himself. You know why? Because he received first. He, he, his mindset, especially outside the covenant, of, especially of the slave mentality that I'm going to have to serve to earn Yet, they just say, Master, and he says, Be whole. You could spend a bunch of hours on that. That right there uh, really deserves two, three hours in and of itself. I might do a special teaching. Maybe we'll come back even into that tomorrow. That's not really an eschatological parable and, and teaching, but it is very important to understand because it shows us the true dynamics of what is pure faith. That's how I want to call it. But let's go into the actual rest of this chapter. And the rest of this chapter is eschatological in nature. And if you were listening as we were talking through it, you've heard some of these similarities before. So when Jesus says, the kingdom of God, not with observation, <clears throat> somebody will say, there he is, there he goes. And Jesus says, don't go. The same way he said in Matthew 24 and 25, Matthew 24 specifically, false Christ will rise up and say, there he is, there he goes. And he said, don't follow them. Don't go. He said, because the kingdom of God, you can't see it with your physical eyes. I make this comparison that it's like a telescope. You can't look out into space and say, there's the kingdom of God coming. Jesus is uh, four light years away. Next year, he's two light years away. That means he's going to be here this year. You know, we, got, we can count the days. You know, we're going to uh, measure his speed in his coming. We're going to figure out exactly what date. Like, it's not like that. 
But so many people like with observation, with my physical eyes, not by fate, based on things, I will say there he is. And Jesus says, that's not how it is. The kingdom of God is within you. Meaning the fullness of the Godhead dwells inside of you. The kingdom of God is not about the location. It's about the relationship with almighty God. You know, eternal life. If I, if I ask a random person on the street, what is eternal life? The first response is going to be living forever, you know, or, or they'll repeat me and they'll say eternal life. That's eternal life is eternal life. I have to laugh because most people wouldn't even know how to define it. That what they would say, it's living forever. And I go, it's not. And they say, what do you mean? I, I, eternal life is living for, I said, it's not. The Bible declares that you have eternal life right now. How can you have eternal life right now if every man must face death except for those that are alive when Jesus comes back? So if you have to die, which means you're not living forever, how do you have eternal life right now? Because the Bible declares eternal life to be knowing God and the, his son whom he sent. Relationship with the Father and the Son through the person of the Holy Spirit that is eternal life. It's very different than what most people, it's not living forever. It's relationship with the Godhead. And Jesus said, it says about Jesus that all the fullness of the Godhead dwell inside of him bodily and his spirit that was in him is in you. So all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in you. That's why the kingdom of God is within you. Because everything is right here. It's in the belly. Out of the belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's why... The things that are spiritual can't only be discerned by the Spirit. You can't naturally discern the things of God because you can't see them with the physical eyes. That is why the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. Because you could argue with people, but the manifestations of the power of God through the gifts of the Holy Spirit is what proves the people that are natural and carnal with their physical eyes to see something that we know by the Spirit that lives on the inside of us. That right there is a lot of information and a lot of different powerful gold nuggets. I pray you caught that. You might need to hit the pause button a couple times and write all that down because that's a boom, 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 boom. And uh, that, there's probably 30 verses that I just railed off back to back to, to give you that understanding. But let's keep going. He said, the days will come. You desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Now that's powerful. One of the days. What does it mean, one of the days of the Son of Man? Because most people, when they think about the return of the Son of Man, the trumpet goes, bop. Jesus goes, whoo. It's over. That's how people think about the second coming of the Lord. They think it'll just, the trumpet will blast, bop. And then Jesus will come across like lightning, whoo. And it's over. That's not the way that the Bible declares the coming of the Lord. It's the blasting in the days of the sounding. The trumpet will go, bah, and it'll, and it'll keep holding. It'll blow, and it'll blow until the people of God are taken up off the earth. That's what's going to happen. And Jesus will come on a cloud for every eye to see him. And, and, I, and I think Mike Bickle had such a powerful uh, teaching on this where he said, Do you really think? I think it's a great question. Do you really think that the God of Genesis 1 spoke heaven and earth? I mean, from eternity past, the Father who sits on the throne, that when he lets his son come back, do you really believe that he needs Bill Gates or Steve Jobs? You know, the iPhone or the internet, TV, to be able to see him. He's the God of Genesis 1. Now here's something else about that that's very interesting because people are like, well, the Wi-Fi and phones. There are still people on the earth, untouched tribes, that don't have cell phones. There's still places out there where there is no internet. So for him to be seen of all people, if it was to be done like that, then every place on the earth would have to have it. Yet everybody on the earth does not have technology. When it says every eye will see him, it means it will physically see him in the cloud. That's what it's talking about. 
But what it's talking about is you will want to see the coming of the Son of Man. But here's what the people will say. There he is. There he goes. Come here. Come there. And Jesus says you can't get swept up in what people say. Because listen, you will be so desirous, you ready, of seeing the Lord that you will get caught in deception. You know, there are people today that are so eager to see the Lord. I'm eager to see the Lord. I'm ready to see the Lord. But they're so about seeing the Lord that if somebody stood up on a platform and said, Christ is here, come here, they'd book the next plane ticket. They'd be on the first flight out to get there as fast as they could with everything they have in the bank, in their pocket, to give an offering. And Jesus said, that's wrong. He said, that will be the deception. Remember, the abomination of desolation. The counterfeit comes first. Before the abomination, he masquerades around like a man of peace for three and a half years. So you're telling me there's a man who's going to masquerade around like a man of peace. He's going to be a counterfeit. He's going to come before the real Christ. And there are people today that are going to be so caught up and so unaware of the truth that they might just go right into the trap you know there's you know i don't know any better way to explain it than that people want the lord yet they don't have biblical truth somebody says jesus is back and they're gone they're going after it and jesus is telling you stop that i know you want to see me listen you might not even see me you might die before i return but don't get swept up into thinking That when somebody says it, they're right. He says, you don't have to listen to anybody. He said, because when I come, every eye will see me. Not just them, every eye. You don't have to go somewhere. You will meet Christ where you're at because he will be seen of you where you're at. He says, "As as the lightning lighteth one part to the other. Now, For the lightning, when most people think of lightning, that's where they think of the whoosh, it's over. You know, it's bang, it's done. No, when it talks about the lightning coming out of heaven from one side to the other, what it's referring to is that from one end of the earth to the other, everybody will see him. That's what it's talking about as the light. It's not talking about it's going to happen so fast that it's hard to see. No, it's going to be seen of all people just as a lightning bolt comes from the top to the bottom. It is seen of all people when it strikes. If you've ever been in a thunderstorm, you see the lightning. When the lightning cracks the sky from God to earth, from heaven to the ground, it is seen of all people. That's what it's talking. It's not talking about the speed of a lightning bolt. You know, Jesus' holy procession. To come and get his prepared bride is going to be two seconds. Boom. It's over. That's not what it's going to be. He's not rushing the process. You know, if you just take some time to think about it. Jesus has been under God the Father's long suffering. Held back from coming for 2,000 years. He's been held back from coming for 2,000 years. Because God's been long suffering with man. To bring forth the great end gathering. And you're telling me. That when it's finally time to bring forth the harvest, that you're telling me that it's going to happen in two seconds? I don't think so. I I don't agree with that at all. So, just giving you some, some little tidbits to think about. Now... Let's uh let's talk about this days of Noah. I know we're kind of skipping around and skipping some details, but like I said, we've talked about all the rest of this before. Jesus is rejected. You know, we, we understand that. And he was rejected in his generation, also in the generation in which he will return, he will be rejected. They will be waging war against Christ. But let's talk about this. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. So we got days of Noah, which we understand that the simple teaching of the days of Noah is the violence. Also, the thing that I love about the days of Noah, water came as a mist up out of the ground to water the face of the earth. Noah, as a preacher of righteousness, Noah, as a just and perfect man in his generation, preached and proclaimed and declared water from the sky. And people were like, ah, that ain't happening. And what they did 
without heeding the word of Noah as they went into living their lives. Eat, drank, married, gave in marriage, focused on the temporal. We're so caught up in the things of this earth and sensual pleasures and the violence that was raging on the earth. They were caught up in the earthly things. And Noah's proclaiming something. You ready? That had not happened yet. This is an important truth because in the generation in which the Lord returns, the church is going to be proclaiming something. You ready? That has not happened yet. It's not that it just hasn't happened, meaning we haven't got to that time period on the prophetic clock, but it hasn't happened in history. Meaning, fire came down from heaven. In your Bible, one, you know, it, it came on Mount Sinai. Elijah called down fire. But fire to burn the whole earth hasn't happened yet. You're talking about all the sea becomes blood. That hasn't happened yet. I mean, there's a lot, 100-pound hailstones from the sky. That hadn't happened yet. There's a lot of things that the church is going to be proclaiming about the generation in which the Lord, the judgments of God, what God is going to do, that the world has not seen. You know, what we proclaim, we're going to go into a city and we're going to plant a church. It hadn't happened yet, but we've done those things before. You know, we planted Blank Slate Ministries in Chicago. We go and plant another church. We've done it before. We can do it again. That's easy. There's experience. There's historical accounts. There's things that make that obvious to, re to understand and to receive and to believe. But if I said we planted a church in Chicago and now God is going to rain fire down from heaven. People are going to look at you like, well, how do you know that? Well, well, God made water come out of the sky. You're so used to water coming out of the sky in Noah's generation. There wasn't water... Water from the sky should be a witness every time you see it that God can rain fire down and destroy the whole earth. Burn the whole earth. Purify it by fire. You should think that every single time it rains. Every single time you get in a thunderstorm. Every single time you have a little mist coming out of the sky. Every time you see water fall down, you should think, God told Noah a hundred years in advance about that. A hundred years in advance, God told Noah that water was coming from the sky. And Noah knew that. A hundred years, he proclaimed it with nobody responding. That's the other part about the days of Noah that you cannot forget is that not only did Noah proclaim it, not only did Noah preach it, not only did Noah believe it and walk it out, but Noah got no response. The question is, if you got absolutely no response in your ministry, meaning nobody would receive you, nobody would listen to you, no growth, no, if, if nobody stood with you, when you proclaim the truth of God's word, would you continue to do it? Or would you quit along the journey? But then it compares it to the days of Lot. And the days of Lot, we know, is immorality. So, days of Noah is violence. Days of Lot is immorality. Two go usually hand in hand together. But in the generation in which the Lord returns, these will be the two main factors, violence and immorality. You know, transgressors come into fullness. But also, when it talks about the days of light, fire and brimstone from heaven. So we do have uh, pictures of God doing this in the Old Testament. Like I said, Elijah prayed down fire, fire and brimstone on Sodom. But the church is going to be proclaiming against the whole world. And the judgments of God in the seals, the trumpets, and the vials have never been seen like that before. And the church is going to have to stand and proclaim them without any historical account of those types of things. You know, a third of the green grass is burnt up. A third of the trees have burned up and all the green grass is gone. Like that, That's never been seen before. They paralleled the things out of Moses and what happened with Pharaoh. There's parallels with Sodom, with Noah, with Elijah, with different things. But to the extent that they are, Revelation is reserved for one generation. But the part I want you to catch is the fact that in the day of the Son of Man, it says don't return back unto the house. We know that means run because obviously we know that that's talking about the abomination of desolation. Don't go back in your house. Run from the Antichrist. But the part I want you to see is it compares to Lot's wife. Now, if you remember what happened with Lot, <clears throat> uh, God met Abraham in the heat of day at Miramar and ate with Abraham, 
proclaim the truth of Abraham's inheritance. And then Abraham had a conversation with God where he pled for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he pled for them. 50, 40, 30, 20, and then got to 10. And God said, if there's 10 people, I will not destroy it. That The two angels of the Lord go down in there. The men try to come after the angels to rape angels. Lot pulls the angels in the house. And the angels say, pack your stuff. We're leaving right now. We're leaving tonight. And they leave. And on the journey out, Lot, his wife, and his two, two daughters... And the two angels on the way out and the angels say, do not turn back. God's going to rain down fire from heaven and destroy this immorality off the face of the earth. And on the way out, Lot and his daughters looking forward, continue to move forward. Yet Lot's wife turned back. Now here's something I want you to understand. If you look back, you ready? You'll always have an opportunity to quit and return. The reason why God used supernatural sustainment in the wilderness with the people of Israel after delivering them through the Red Sea. Quail and manna in the morning. The reason why he did that was to destroy the slave mentality. Why? Because a slave mentality, a captivity mindset, will always cause you to look back. And if you look back, you now have the opportunity to return. You have the opportunity to quit. And Lot's wife looked back. And he said, that is whosoever shall seek to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses it will save it. That's that understanding. She looked back. Well, what if I can go back and say, and you lost it. If you quit, if you think about quitting and you start to go there, you'll end up turning back. And then the last part of this, the uh, Two men, two women, two men, one left, one taken, judgment of God, understanding. There's two main thoughts that most people have. One, this is saints being pulled out of the earth. And the other understanding is people reserved unto judgment. We're not going to talk about that today because we're going to talk about that tomorrow. So, Father, I thank you. Bless everybody under the sound of my voice. I give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day. And we will pick this up tomorrow. The sparrows not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lilies not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Because you take good care of me. The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. Your good.